All right, good afternoon, Council. We have uh, a committee of the whole meeting agenda for approval. Adoption, thank you. Adoption, all in favor? I hope everyone got the uh, slight amendment to the delegations. Uh, we have two delegations, not three. And we're going to have the representatives of the all organizations, the chambers and company, present first. So, uh, welcome to the podium, sir. Okay. And, uh, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Well, with me today is uh, Jenny, Merrill, and Carol. We're going to jump in if I get myself sideways or have really hard questions to ask. Um, uh, and so I'm going to give a brief presentation on pickleball. And I assume that maybe perhaps some of you have never heard of it. Uh, I know a lot of people I bump into, they scratch their head and wonder, what are you talking about? Uh, Pickleball uh, was invented in 1965, uh, just south of us on Bainbridge Island, uh, Washington. Um, and it was, uh, according to the U.S. Um, Pickleball Association, the, the name came from a dog, Pickles, who likes to hide the ball. So there's a bit of trivia for you. If anybody asks where did this name come from, it's based upon the name of a dog. I point this one there is. In terms of the sport, the sport has grown quite ex extensively. It's uh, played uh, quite a bit uh, down in the southern states uh, with lots of outdoor parks. This is what the game looks like. And it's, it's as I say, it's growing quite quickly. Um, there are nearly 200,000 courts. Uh, around 200,000 players, 8,000 courts, and 250,000, or 2,500 places to play in North America. And here in Canada, uh, 290 places to play, uh, with 7 or 10 courts, and an estimated number of players as of early this year of 14,000, of which 7,000 are believed to reside in British Columbia, so it's quite popular here in BC. And so, who are all these players? Well, there's some more like some players playing pickleball. Um, and I put up here a little bit of a list of where one can go to play the sport. There are some national organizations in the US, Spain, France, the Netherlands, and of course here in Canada. And in BC, here are, here's a short list of all the clubs that are currently in place. And here's more of those clubs. So it is it's growing by leaps and bounds, and you can see by a detailed examination of the list that it's quite popular on that Uh As an organization, we came together uh, in just December of last year, and in five months, we've grown to a club of 121 members. Uh, we're quite pleased with that, and with some of our Pickleball players come back to Comox Valley after spending time down south. We expect, we expect this number to continue to expand. Um, I, by way of comparison, I believe the last piece of literature I could find on the internet was that the tennis club has 160 members, so that gives you some sort of sense of portion. And you would say, well, who, who plays pickleball? Isn't it just for seniors? Um, Late last week, even though it was spring break, I was able to get to hold some of the staff at the school district, and they were able to provide me some lists of names of some of the schools that play pickleball here in the Combox Valley. And I was told uh, that um, this list was not a complete list, but there are some examples of pickleball being taught at the schools. So it's quite likely that uh, some of the youngsters in the community will know more about it than their parents will. So where does one go and play pickleball with family and friends on a Saturday afternoon? Nowhere. Unlike tennis, the Comebox Valley does not provide free facilities for public use. How can this grief and justice be addressed and corrected? I'm glad you asked that question. Uh, by the addition of permanent outdoor pickleball courts which would complement the suite of excellent outdoor facilities already available in Comox. And the Pickleball Association would like to offer its support to such an endeavor. Uh, here's a picture of the pickleball courts uh, that were constructed over in Paul River. And uh, to give you some sort of sense of what we're talking about in terms of costs, a 
six pickleball courts fit in the same space as two tennis courts. And the uh, initial loss, uh, cost estimates for new courts, six new courts would be uh, $50,000 to $60,000. You could alternatively resurface and convert to underutilized tennis courts for a cost of $18,000 to $25,000. So, let's go forward and make some outdoor pickleball courts. Let's make this happen. That's, that's the presentation, and we'd love to take your questions. Okay, questions from members of council. Now, Mr. McKinnon. Yes, thank you for the presentation, first of all. And, um, I noticed that in my neighborhood that, uh, that you were playing outdoor pick pickleball in the lower rink by the yes. Highland Fields there. Yes. And uh, it seemed to be well attended and, yes. uh, 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 by lots of folks there. Uh, was there a problem with that? Because that seems like a perfect site right there uh, and not used a lot in the... Uh, um, during the, particularly during the daytime, when kids are in school and all. Right. So uh, there are, is, there you'll see pickleball players play pickleball there. Uh, and I probably expect that most of what you're seeing was part of a program offered through the Comox Rec Center. And the nets that are being used are property of the, uh, the town of Comox, designated for a program. Uh, so uh, that does fill the use. Uh, for those who want to join up and sign up for a program, okay, the, the, the fee to play on it. Tuesday or Thursday afternoon, I think of us in the mornings. Uh, but it doesn't uh, fit the need for sort of spontaneous, uh, you know, families or friends who wish to play. Most of the programs are either age-related or skill-related. Uh, so unlike uh, tennis, if I just want to go and play tennis with my daughter, I don't have to worry about her age or her skill level. I just play tennis with my daughter. Uh, but not so pickleball. I'll generally have to be with a group of seniors, or I get uh, I play with a, a set of people of my same skill. Uh, so it's not quite the same thing. Apart from that, uh, the facility there is is good from the perspective of its location, um, but there's no permanent hosts and there's no permanent nets, and it's also a shared use area as well. All right, uh, Councillor Graham. Yeah, I was just wondering um, on your cost estimates to buildings, you've got uh, fifty to sixty thousand. But we just did read our tennis courts, and it was a half a million dollars. So I don't. Yeah, I, that's I, quite a difference. <laughs> appreciate that, and uh, I, to come by that number, I did two things. I did an internet search, um, and I spoke to Al this morning about what his thoughts were in terms of cost, and so that's where that number comes from. Um, I, and discussing the tennis ones, I understand that the uh, the base there was fundamentally an issue in terms of the soils and, and the previous history of creeks and water and such like. Uh, so that's where I expect the major cost difference would be. And secondly, it seems to me that this would be a, a regional thing. I mean, not just people from Comox are going to come to play pickleball. Um, so would it not be more sensible to be having this as a re to, to be talking to the regional district about possibly doing this and encompassing It, it may well be. I, you know, I'm, I'm certainly not <coughs> experienced in terms of uh, yep. these sorts of processes, and there could be an avenue or, or another opportunity to with other organizations for certain. Okay. Yeah, for example, there's a group that's looking at indoor tents uh, at the mobile type facility, uh, and they've been working through the regional district on a feasibility study. I know there are different types of courts, but there may be some synergies, some perhaps. Reason, right? But anyway, we'll see. Uh, Councilor Arnott. Yeah. Um, with, with that, could you could you not paint different lines in like an existing tennis court? You know, sim similar like a gym, gymnasium. They have all sorts of lines for different games. Could you have something similar to that on existing tennis courts, so that you can go in? Okay, you know these lines. Are yep. Yeah, we talked about that as well. Um, and uh, and it could be like an uh, I, I characterize as an option C, not an A, not B, down the list. The difficulty with that that the height of the nets are different, um, so that poses a problem immediately. Uh, currently, most of the nets are kind of locked in place. Um, I've heard people talk about weighing them down. I'm not sure if that's really a sort of good solution for the for the nets. Um, and then you'll probably have to deal with complaints from both groups of tennis players and pickleball players about the lines being confusing. Um, so those are probably the fundamental issues. Um, 
And uh, my initial thoughts were if you could, you know, keep both those communities apart for probably less animosity about the Thank you. Uh, again, uh, thank you for coming. I, I know that uh, I was able to participate in a bit of a pickleball challenge uh, last year with uh, Jim Stevenson, our former rec director. And I don't think that caused him to go into retirement after I whipped him. But, uh, <laughs> no, I just kidding. Um, I think that uh, the sport has certainly grown. It's certainly been a big part of the Comox Rec Center itself. I know that there are challenges at times to find uh, space for programming and also for casual play. Uh, as someone who was involved in constructing the um, outdoor hockey box, uh, that was my year as Rotary president here back in 98 99. I see that there is some benefit to sharing that facility, but I also see some potential conflict. I wouldn't want to see it turned into a pickleball facility because that's not what it was built for. That being said, there is land next to that that is under lease uh, with the school district that might be a possible um, location for a court should funds be raised. And I guess I have two questions. One is, have you looked at specific locations in the town? And two, have you done any fundraising yet? Yeah, so both good questions. Uh, we have looked at various locations in the town, and I think the site you refer to is probably, uh, you know, in my opinion, at least, maybe the, the best option available to us. In terms of fundraising, um, we were both to sit down and, and begin that exercise. The thought across my mind, at least, is that wouldn't our success with respect to fundraising uh, be better if we had some sort of indication of support from a community that are willing to sort of to lease to host the site? and to maintain it going forward. Right. So I guess my request or plea to you today would be uh, if you can give us some sort of indication of support by way of a letter or something, a qualified support, uh, that would be useful in terms of our next step in terms of going forward seeking funds. Okay. So what we do with delegation requests is uh, we essentially get staff to provide us with a report. <coughs> we don't generally act on them unless there's an emergency at this same meeting. So. I would expect that staff should be able to provide us with at least a preliminary report in two weeks' time, and then we'd uh, consider your request as, with all this background material, sure. and then our parks and rec directors can provide input through the staff uh, head here at our CAO and bring that to council. Appreciate that. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you for your presentation and for the time. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, so, um, just let the room clear for a second. All right, the next uh, delegation I have a conflict of interest on, and Councillor Price will take the chair, and also for the staff report to follow. So, uh, give me a buzz when you're done. If you just got pickleball, then you'll have a conflict of interest next week. I'm actually not I've never had a chance to.
So I want to start, if I can, with the site plan, Marvin. Is it, uh, is it up? Uh, site plan that I uh, showed as not being in your package today it was in fact finished by Bruce Lewis today. A couple of the um, a couple of things that we had to address were on the Comox Avenue side where the planter is right down at the bottom. Uh, planning, the planning and engineering staff wanted a minimum of two meters clearance between the patio and the planter. In the past, uh, that, that area has been very tight for the general public to walk through. And uh, I'm not, uh... Excuse me, Sean, I don't mean to No, no, no problem. My head is in the way. <laughs> you could just say when you want it advanced, and we'll advance on it. Sure. Is there a pointer on this, Martin? Or? Uh... uh area. Uh, the landowners have agreed to um, give up a little bit of their property to ensure that the sidewalk <coughs> has a minimum of two meters clearance. Also on the corner, uh, they've given up a six meter uh, road dedication for uh, the corner and the sidewalk area, which uh, the town has future plans uh, for uh, seating and, and whatnot. Uh, the uh, tree that's going to be saved is also, you'll see uh, curve uh, around the tree, something that we worked with the landscape uh, designers uh, to ensure the safety of the tree. There's also um, the, the letdowns that uh, in the previous models weren't shown. Uh, so all the, the letdowns on the sidewalks down to the our driveways, they're all down shown. So the rendering, next one, uh, no? We had, um, we had provided the planning department with some color boards and uh, they were actually quite, quite nice and they had all the colors of the building but uh, in the last couple of weeks we decided to take a step out and uh, hire another firm to do a colored rendering of the building to try to uh, delineate clearly, as clear as we can on a, on a, on a flat screen with a three dimensional drawing, some of the changes that we've made since the open house and the uh, December 17th council meeting. <clears throat> Planning felt it was very important to highlight the corner facing the intersection at uh, Comox and uh, Port Augusta. So a couple things we've done, we've, we've beefed up the, the posts uh, for the covered entry. And we've gone to natural stain as opposed to the white stain that uh, was shown in the last uh, color board. You can see more clearly up here, the, the old Lorne Hotel had some uh, what they call knee brace uh, accents uh, on all the posts on the front of the building. Uh, so in the corners of the building and, and all the posts on the main floor as well as the second floor, all the, uh, the timber posts all have these knee brace uh, items that are, are traditionally known as a heritage feature. The blue, the marine blue uh, posts that um, separate the bistro patio as well as the uh, pub patio. Uh, a better, this is not a Russian sub right here. <laughs> um, the architects that uh, took the pictures, uh, they, they took the pictures and they, they were under a bit of a timeline to get this thing um, all together for us. This is actually the planter that is this size that actually is in front of the Lauren Hotel. So my apologies for uh, any confusion but, uh, or alarm that may cause. And it's not in the middle of the street. It's not in the middle of the street. <laughs> no. So the... Um, the, we, we have to have a barrier from the liquor establishment to the public area. So those uh, marine blue posts have, they're going to be either uh, chain or a polished uh, stainless cable 
in little loops, and they are in there. You can see one right there, and they loop between from post to post. So it, it gives a real open feel. Uh, also, that nautical, that nautical feel that uh, you do see on some promenades and decks in other communities. The one of the things that uh, we were asked to do is try and draw the the uh, attention to the main floor of the building. So. Uh, in, in doing that, we had to encompass the second level as well. In the last uh, rendition of the plan, the railings were a mixture of glass, solid, and some picket. Now, when we did our research and looked at some coastal old hotels along the, uh, what did we find one, Steveston, um, Seashell, uh, Sydney, uh, most of these old hotels, just like the Lorne, had picket, white picket railings on the second floor. And again, that is a, that is a feature that uh, just about all these uh, old buildings had. So we've incorporated that now into all the decks on the second floor. The, the upper floors, again, we actually, in some of these areas, we had solid walls uh, and glass on the front uh, to create some privacy buffers for the residents that will inhabit the building. Planning department, uh, along with the architects, came to the consensus that um, going with all glass and having a, a real fluid look to the building was uh, was a much better way to go. Um, one thing I'd like to point out: again, we did do the timber uh, rail, the, the timber post up on the third floor here, uh, again to try to draw the eye to the corner of the building, which is part of the um, uh, part of some of the guidelines. It's a little bit difficult to uh, to see this, but just to, just to be clear, the, each floor of the building steps back as it goes to the top. Okay? That, that corner is not a, not a solid uh, a wall going up. Um, one thing that uh, has come out of the rendering, which we could not uh, ascertain from the one-dimensional plans that the, our, our architects were providing for us, was the glass on the front of the building, uh, on the pub and the beast in particular. Our, our old windows looked quite squatty. They, they did not uh, give a commercial look and a feel to those. So, now this has come quite late, and um, we've asked the planning department if you guys would consider in, in a schedule, schedule one that we were, were able to add this, this extra height uh, for the windows so that the, both the, the outside and the inside of the building uh, look and function a little bit better. What else have we got here? The, the plan that you saw at the open house had actually a fairly inconsistent flow of awning, both the retractable awning, which are here and over here, and the fixed uh, covers, which are here, here, and on the pub entrance over here. The pub entrance at the, uh, at the public open house had a glass uh, dome cover. And it didn't flow with the building. Uh, so we've actually replaced that so that the, the timber covers with the, with the skylights with, uh, are consistent for uh, the bistro, the, the covered area where the <coughs> two-sided glass fireplace is, as well as the pub entrance. That was a big, uh, a big item. Um, the planning department gave us uh, feedback with respect to some of the functional things with uh, where we had bike racks and scooters. On the entrance to the pub, we actually flip flop those so that uh, the scooters are on the other side. Over here, and you can see it quite faintly, is the area uh, that we've designated um, 20 feet wide by 10 feet high for a, a artist uh, mural of the historic Rome Hotel. There will also be some verbiage on the history of the Lone Hotel in that same space. And uh, that is actually like a 20 by 10 area is a big area inside of the building. So that's going to be quite a feature uh, to try to recapture uh, what was. I'm just going to check my notes here really quick to see if I've uh, missed anything. Not come out that great. They are um, 
you've ever seen the traditional blue, green, and white uh, roll-up awnings. They add a bunch of vibrancy and color to the front of the building, so that, that's another thing that didn't come up that uh, great in this uh, rendering. One thing that you can't see in behind separating the bistro and the patio area. We've created a little V-space that sets back into the patios that's going to be a small public amenity space. And if any of you have ever been to the big cruise ship docks, you see the big cleats? Uh, we're going to have probably Ivan Timberframe uh, build uh, cleat seats. So they, they look like ship cleats, uh, but they will actually be seats for people to sit and face one another well, they can sit and watch you know, people walk by. And, uh, and those uh, drawings are actually in the package that the planning department uh, has. And I think that's, uh, I think that's uh, it. Thank you. Questions? Probably by Berwick. Okay. 
before you can see that. And what's the intention of that space? That is a, a, an open space for the residents. Okay. So the, the people in the strata can book that out if they have a, a family barbecue or, or other function. Yeah, but not for um, not for the patrons that come upstairs. Yeah, and, not for uh, upstairs. Any more questions? Well, that um, looks like that the, uh, the sum total. I don't know if you have any ideas of how you can get the new look to the building out there uh, to the public. Yeah. Uh, I bet these guys could do something about that. <laughs> 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 I think, uh, would that come at the public hearing? The, the advertisement, um, public hearing would say that it was for the rezoning application. Um, and anybody who wished to come in and take a look at the uh, rendering and the revised drawings we have in the building. Great. So there would be a bit of time beforehand for people to come and take a look. Yes. Great. Thank you. Lovely, well thank you. And uh, so we will move on now. Um, thank you for your time. You're welcome. And we can, before the mayor comes back, and we all with the staff report. The receipt of the staff report is first. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Because you just got to amend the schedule of one to include the windows. Okay, yeah, because I've got the, I'm working on the goal. Yeah, but because they, they want to add this to schedule one, so okay. you, can, you can receive the report, then this one, and then the public hearing staff motions. So I'll move receipt of the report. I'll second. Thank you. So we have the report in front of us. Mm -hmm. So any questions on the report? Here, here, I second that. Great. So, um, we have um, recommendations. All in favor of receipts. All in favor of receipts. Good job, you're on the board. And uh, seeing no one opposed, that's carried. And then we have the, a public hearing um, located at the Comox Community Centre. Uh, be scheduled for this uh, amendment. I'll move that. I'll second that. And do we need to be putting a date in, or that will come later? We're, uh, we haven't finalized it, but we're looking at uh, May 8th or 13th, I believe, somewhere in that, that area. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we have the recommendation to uh, go to public hearing. And uh, any discussion? If not, yeah. can we have to have that business with the windows? Okay. okay. So all in favour? Anyone opposed? That's carried. And then we'll allow a little bit of time beforehand for people to come in and see the renditions. So um, so this is when we get to the schedule one. Okay. Okay, the schedule one. Outstanding items be amended to include floor to ceiling windows on the ground floor. Move. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Carried. Thank you.
greater interest than that.
determine if they were interested in a piece of property, what exactly the development potential was for that property, um, and any upfront known costs such as development cost charges. So we'll be putting that together uh, to finish the current phase. So uh, key, key initiatives. So the first one was process transparency and accuracy. So the checklist, it's a comprehensive checklist. That checklist is the exact same checklist that staff will use to assess whether or not an application is completed. So there's one checklist, both sides are using it. Uh, in terms of ease of use, we're looking at uh, everything from small to large. So small things, um, application form. Typically, in the past, we've had an application form. Then if you were the applicant and you weren't the owner, you had to get a separate letter um, from the owner uh, to allow to act uh, on their behalf, so authorization of the owner. We've now rolled that actually into the application form itself. Uh, similarly, our old form had a number of specifications. So the specifications that they just were attached. We've now um, updated those specifications and we put them in a straight checklist, checklist format so they can check what they submitted with their application. It's easily then seen by staff and we can do a faster turnaround time. We're also um, using that checklist to highlight easily overlooked requirements, uh, sort of give a heads up. And um, as we have uh, numerous development permit areas, and some of those actually have uh, implications for what the application itself as to what material is, is presented, we've broken that down in the checklist by the development permit guideline um, so that people, people have that and it's easy to use. So in terms of those, the application form is just a straight two-page uh, two application form. We've taken great care to stop with the filling the same information five times over. So a lot of the details you get on the application are actually part of the development rationale. Um, so the application form itself is a simple, what is the zoning, what is the zoning that you want, what is the development permit area that you're in. Even there, we're trying to use sort of suggestive uh, techniques to guide people to giving us the right information with the right terminology. So we've got things like a development permit just listed there. All you have to do is check. If you're in multiple ones, you're just checking them off. You're only listing it once. <coughs> uh, and then the uh, signature. We may have built into this one very clearly what happens if the uh, owner is a corporation in terms of the authorizations that are required. So it's one form that does everything from one individual person joint ownership to corporate ownership. So straightforward uh, checklist. So we have the front intro checklist items. Each one with a nice little box is on the uh, left column. And then we're using the right column to under the checklist item if there's additional information, something that's highlighted that's uh, easily overlooked. We've done that in the right column. So something that you can actually read. Um, so DPA specific requirements. So for example, we have here, when we get into the site plans, these different um, development permit areas are for multifamily development with development permit guidelines require accessible access. So then this is triggering, it's already saying, that, okay, then show your grades to make sure that we do have accessible access. One of the things that um, Sean Vincent was alluding to in his presentation on the revised drawings. Um, the uh, and also we get into um, items of like easily overlooked items. When the applications are coming in, a lot of these applications, such as the Lorne, are coming in with additional road dedication. They're also coming in with infrastructure improvements within the road dedication. So the idea that that's clearly, clearly shown in the drawings and researched right at the beginning. So when the application is submitted. And also as the heads up, some of these are having um, encroachments in terms of landscaping, things like awnings. Um, we start getting very concerned at that time in terms of our liability for those structures and also maintaining our rights in the long term that we can use it for real public road purposes. So it's the heads up right away that if you're going to do that, that's fine, but then that's going to be a road encroachment agreement. And there's going to be a separate road plan that's going to be attached to a legal document that then requires annual proof of insurance and clarifies that we have the right at any time to remove those encroachments and use them. Vertical integration of the development process. What that really gets at is these rezonings um, are really starting to touch multiple departments, everything from administration to public works to parks. Um, and 
so we try to build all of that into the checklist. So everything is there right at the beginning, is transparent. So we built in the pre-application um, consultation, i.e. how does the developer then present that so that it's useful information to council. Um, tree retention and removal, which has caused us several issues in the past as we've gotten into the area, um, simply because the different professions often utilize different techniques, some as simple as marking trees. Some professions, market tree is supposed to be removed, the other one's market tree is supposed to be saved. You go out on site, and there was a public go on site, you have no idea if this tree is going or not, uh, or staying. Road dedication, um, as I just touched on, municipal infrastructure up upgrades, road encroachment, EC hydro transformer locations. This has been a real problem over the years, and we finally have a resolution to that. And uh, I'll get into that a little bit later in the presentation. Garbage removal and tear up, making sure that they can actually get the trucks in to access the garbage compounds. Um, and then tying it into the recent council initiative with the affordable housing calculator, parking calculator, sound attenuation, and also many of these, especially the lower density multifamily forms like townhouses, they're phased developments. And if we know that they're phased at the beginning, we can build in um, the necessary um, phasing allowances so they don't have to come in for a separate it's scalable, so um, the rezoning and DP is the master checklist. Um, the other ones will be subcomponents of it, but even there, we try to design it such that we can readily, physically, I can cross out sections of the applicant that doesn't apply to a specific application, or hopefully be able to do that on the computer and present one clean. Uh, this one's been really informed, clarity of application requirements, recognizing the needs of the applicant. It started to become quite apparent that we were originally very hesitant to dictate certain approvals from other agencies with that set of kind of heavy handed. But we had the request from the development industry, and when we started to think about it, well, it made sense. I mean, if we're sitting there and saying, you have to go to Interra to get approval, the developer he goes up to MTR, and MTR goes, what developer? Mm -hmm. The developer doesn't, he's going to guess. He's going to do the work. He's going to guess. This is the drawings. Then MTR is going to guess on what, how to reference that and give it back to us. Um, so we start realizing that there's a little ping pong ball effect with the development we get into. So the more forms that we actually give and clearly state what is required and it's plug and play for the developer and for that third party, either consultant or agencies like the the simpler it is. Um, so that's what we're getting at. Uh, we now have a form that's attached that goes to Amterra. We've proofed it with Amterra. They know who, they know what they're going to get. There's a contact person, um, uh, so they're well aware of it. Uh, it works with their uh, procedures. Landscape estimate, that's another thing where we require a landscape estimate for bonding. Um, but the developer then goes to a landscape company and they have various different ways of providing that information comes back to us, then goes to parks, parks comes out and says I need more information, and the whole thing repeats itself. So we now have a comprehensive form that's again scalable that they can fill out. Um, we in terms of the transformer locations, um, as we're getting to these tighter and more dense sites, we're pushing buildings and we're utilizing the site. Pushing buildings close to the street. And the fundamental problem has always been that the developer then says we can't tell you where Hydro is going to put the transformers until we do our detailed servicing. It's too expensive to do it up front. Um, and then all of a sudden, we issue the DP, we issue the zoning, and we find out that now the transformers got no place to be located, and it's in the middle of the sidewalk. And we're compromising our accessibility to the sidewalk in terms of minimum widths. Um, and really, I want to um, credit um, Derek Jensen of McElhaney um, and Dylan Gothard, uh, the design manager of BC Hydro, because they both looked at this as to the needs of one of the developer and the other one of Hydro. And especially Hydro now, they're going to third party electrical design consultants. So they're having to coordinate with this. Um, and come up with a solution um, that listed in the checklist as U07 drawings issued for, um, issued for approval. Not issued for construction, they can run $60,000, $80,000 on a 20 unit or a 30 unit townhouse development. Much more manageable cost. What was really surprising is when we were trying to get the terminology right and make sure that the third party electric consultants also agree with it, that we got back from them saying, oh yeah, this is a really good idea because we're having a lot of problems with this. We're getting stuff in the design stage and then it doesn't work when we actually get out into the site. Um, so, just um, again, just examples, quick examples. So, pre application 
might often see something like this. Here we're gonna we actually give the applicant the, the property radius. So to see which properties have to be consulted. The first stage, second stage, no. And we've actually utilized this in some of the applications of the midstream that have been before you, is what we found was this works even better. Follow this up with an actual form. We fill in, we have the little diagram of GIS, we fill that in, we're able to neatly put their contact information and business card in there. It says the type of venue, the timing, how the public um, can um, comment, what happens if you get it and there's nobody at the door and you still want to comment. So one of the things that often comes before council then somebody's saying, well, I wasn't, I wasn't consulted. They're all addressed in this. And so again, that's very much a plug and play. And to our surprise, it's been very well received. It's like, thank you, just tell me what you want and we'll go ahead and do it. Um, and Tara, simple form, right? Your contact information, then it turns around, says exactly in Tara what Tara's gonna fill out, that they know it's residential or it's commercial, where the site is located. Oh, and hey, here's the drawing reference. And yes, we can either service it or no, we can't. Um, because different iterations of drawings, different accessibility issues. And that's it. If there's any questions? Yeah. Sir Kendra. I got two quick questions, both on the same line. Um, what are you going to do if someone comes in with an incomplete application? In incomplete application? Mm -hmm. It will be returned to them if it's sufficiently incomplete, i.e., they didn't try. There's a $250 um, processing charge that's applied. But are we going to start their application unless they bring a completed list back? Um, we will not start their application. We will not date their application as received until such time as we have a complete application. And we started that process a uh, number of years ago. That we just didn't have a comprehensive yeah. form to go with it. That's good. My other question then is the exact opposite. Is What if I come with an absolutely complete application? One of the complaints that we often hear is, you know, the goalposts keep moving. Does this stop this? Like, if I bring my application, it's totally complete. Are there going to be any more changes coming later on, or? There may be. Um, so this application is to get the, so you have a complete application. So if it meets these requirements, it is received. It is dated. It is, uh, the referrals go up, processing goes in. Um, we have an upfront process. Council's legal ability to require development approval information such as traffic studies is, well, logically, once you get an application, because then you can see, do you need a traffic study? Um, chicken and egg for the developer, because by that time, they probably designed your building, and if you do have to do major changes, there are a lot of money. So we do issue uh, preliminary um, development approval information saying what has to be uh, required um, and professional certification. When an application is been received, um, and either a staff sees something additional that is required that wasn't obvious in the first uh, preliminary discussions, or if council sees something, it comes to the council table, and council says, I don't know the public, um, you know, what about this? And council says, yes, what about that? Then they have the opportunity to get that additional information. Other than that, I don't foresee. Um, put it this way, we will constantly monitor this form and update it. If there are um, things that are not required or additional things that are required or changes in regulations, they will be put in the terms. Would it make sense to maybe have a statement in there that says additional information may be required? It is in there. It is in there. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. uh, Council Swift. Um, from what I can understand with all of this, it looks really good to me. I think it's going to be transparent and Hopefully it will help uh, staff as well as the applicants. Um, <clears throat> I'm wondering if built into this, there's any little place for, at the end of the process, for the applicant to provide feedback on the process itself. Um, I'll anticipate we're going to provide a way at the final. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I mean, if there is something that is, isn't working um, or uh, uh, something is, you know, over the top or something like that, it's built so it's scalable so we can easily adjust it. Um, it can be adjusted on staff level so we can do it quickly. Um, and yes, we would be encouraging, but no, there's not a formal um, case comment. Uh, Part of the problem with that too is if you please comment is a lot of developers won't. They actually have a concern because of an application process. Mm. And then by the time that they're no longer have an application process, they're busy doing something else. Yeah. Um, so I think that one of the big things is just having it clear to the developers when they're verbally talking that we are open and this is definitely a document that has to work for both sides. 
communities that have a similar form? That was, that was part of the interesting thing, too, because we thought, like, you know, we didn't want to be overly descriptive and everything else. Um, and then part of the research that was done was small communities, large communities, Parksville, Victoria, and Nanaimo. Yeah, they have these. Um, I mean, they're not quite as, we have tried to be very vertically integrated with all the different requirements. Um, but there's a lot of similar, similarities, and so we weren't reinventing the wheel or being, um, you know, out of, out of uh, sort of the ballpark of what's commonly expected. And that, again, that was very surprising. That other, I mean, I guess you know, it evolved a little bit more than we have in our <laughs> processing, and um, it makes sense for both parts. Thank you. Kelsey Brett. I think there's an underlying message here I'm hearing, and I think what it is is Comox, one more time, is saying, yes, we are open for business, and we're open up with welcome to that. I think I, I like the changes for the short time that I have been here and I've seen them. I applaud it. All right, thanks for that. You're welcome to join us back to the table. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, uh, planning staff, for all your work on that and bringing it forward to it. All right, so moving on to the next item on the agenda, I believe is about the multi-material BC resolution. And this, as I mentioned in the last meeting, is a uh, result of our staff's uh, inquiries with UBCM. And uh, they've come up with some wording for a resolution that we could send to, or if it's endorsed here for the UBCM for consideration. I move the recommendation. Yes. Any discussion further to that? Uh, seeing okay. none, I mean, things may change between now and September, but uh, I think it's a good start. And uh, certainly the Minister of Environment appreciates our efforts in that regard. I know I've been speaking to you. Yes? Yes. So, how many communities did get left out? Well, there were five five larger ones that uh, we knew about for sure, and I think there's still quite a few other small ones. There's, yeah, there's quite a few that are not part of the process. So, uh, yeah, maybe there'll be more information as we go forward. And you were right, um, ADICC deadline for late presentation yeah. is midday today. Yeah, and I, I, I don't believe that it's necessarily something... Um, we need to bring the ABICC is uh, the other communities that are in the top five or from other places off, off the island. So, um, but you see them hopefully will receive it well and then we'll have a chance to speak to it there. Any further? Seeing no, all in favor? Motion is carried. Right, next item on the agenda has been brought to us by Councilor McKinnon. So I'd like him to speak to it and then uh, see where we want to go with it. Councilor McKinnon. Yes, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, just that regarding public engagement uh, by mayor and council, we already have good access uh, for the public to our elected officials in Comox. And I need to say that up front. Uh, you know, the mayor has an open door policy. Councilors' emails are available on the town of Comox website. And uh, we get certainly get uh, citizen contact through that. And we welcome that. Um, and we, and uh, mayor and councilors presently and individually quite often meet with individual citizens about issues as well. Uh, but uh, this public engagement initiative is being suggested to enhance further uh, uh, public engagement by offering quarterly uh, informal coffee meetings uh, with some councillors. And uh, it's intended to have voluntary participation by councillors and to have three or less councillors participate to avoid a quorum. Uh, one of the other councillors, my fellow councillors here, suggest quarterly meetings. I'm uh, open, uh, not married to that. Uh, but I think it's important for public perception that we continue to uh, open the door for uh, uh, public engagement. And uh, I, I'd like to try this uh, for a year. Uh, it's an informal coffee thing. It may be largely a referral to town staff, uh, things about questions and concerns. Uh, it, it may be more. I think we have to, to try it and see. It's not required for councillors. It would be uh, um, open to those that want to uh, to do so, and I would set up a, a sign-up uh, there in our, our mail slots um, with an indication of the dates uh, on there. Uh, what would be clear is that there would have to be at least two councillors there, so we wouldn't have one councillor uh, alone uh, and, and perhaps get a delegation of people and, and you know, put in an uncomfortable situation. Um, 
my suggestion is, is that we try it for a year, and uh, uh, if it, uh, and then we'll come back with feedback to council to see if we want to continue. All right, thanks. Uh, any questions, comments? Yes. Uh, I, I remember back to an all candidates meeting when when he stood up and said, "We used to have these. I'd like to see them repeated." And I very enthusiastically put my hand up and said, "Yes, I think it's a great idea. I do enjoy a one-on-one -on -one because I think there's a greater communication that way. But I think this is a great way of opening the door, and I'd like to put my name on the list." Yes. Uh, I mean, you could already you could you could already do this. I mean, is this just not up to individual councillors if they want to do this? They can do it. I, I've seen other places like Star used to do walk with the mayor. I've seen in other areas where they have a you know meet with su such and such a councillor. And I mean, I'm not sure if you're asking for a resolution here. I mean, you could already do this. So you know, I don't know that we need to formalize it. You could just do it. I'll just respond to that if I can. And uh, yes, we, we can do that. But I think, it, it, in my mind, I think it's important that we send a message to the public that we want to do it as a group and that uh, uh, we're inviting the public feedback. And I, I also need to mention that uh, uh, some members of the public, like all of us, uh, uh, feel more comfortable in an informal setting, uh, having coffee, right, right, uh, listening to questions from other people, and, uh, and raising some concerns that way. Uh, so that uh, that in itself, I think, is it makes the effort worthwhile. Yeah, I think what Councillor McKenna is bringing forward is something a little more formal than you know. Obviously, you you can do it now as you see fit and uh, whatever place and time you want to meet with somebody on whatever issue. But this is a bit more formal, uh, scheduled, um, public notification given, and see who shows up. Mm -hmm. Councillor. Yeah, um, and. I agree with Councillor Grant and McKinnon that I feel I made a commitment at the Brewerick meeting to be open to this, and I'm pleased that you're uh, taking the lead and organizing it. So I'd be happy to, to join those sessions. That's great. Yes, I think it's a great idea, and I think a little bit of support from staff, just making sure that the um, it's on the website and that uh, it's okay. To uh, with the, the venues suggested. Um, but I am a great believer in if you actually go out to where people are, you get a much better response and engagement than if you invite them to um, community centre or the town hall. So I, I think it's a great idea. Kudos to Councillor McKinnon for having it and proceeding with it. So do we need any anything for Well, maybe I'll see you for... Uh, so I think we probably should have a resolution of some kind. And then staff, are there any concerns? And Councillor Arnott, I'll let you speak to you as well. Uh, no, I, I don't think there are any concerns. We pay, we don't want a quorum. Because once once you reach that quorum number four, then it's, it's actually a meeting of council. And one that has to be advertised and one that we have to keep records for. So I would encourage you to keep your numbers at three or below. Uh, and we will, from a staff perspective, uh, assist with the advertising of, of the upcoming events using uh, social media as, as best we can. And our website. And our website. Councilor yeah. okay. Oh, yeah, I was just going to say, don't forget about those of us who still work during the day. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that includes a couple councillors here and, and the public as well. Um, you know, it's for evenings. Because that's what I'm and I did think, think about that, and I, I've written down some uh, 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 contacting uh, all councillors and saying preferred days or times of day uh, in the rotation around for sign up. Uh, uh, so thank you for that. And, yeah. and, uh, I That's a good idea. Yeah. Uh, and I, I would just add that I, you shouldn't forget that, you know, particularly that there are like, younger members of the community um, and families, uh, kids in school. For those considerations, whether you want to be one of these at one of the at the high school or something at some point, that might be an idea as well. Mm -hmm. And I know that because time to time we get asked to go up there and do different mm -hmm. presentations, but uh, that might make it a little more uh, inclusive, perhaps, is the word I'm looking for. Uh, all right, so a motion uh, to support the uh, coffee with Comox councillors uh, proposal as outlined by Councillor McKenna. Okay, so moved. Mm -hmm. So moved. Seconder. Second. Any 
further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Motion's carried. All right, thank you, Council. And Councilor McKinnon for bringing that forward. Excuse me, Your Worship. Yes, ma'am. Uh, while you were absent, we very quickly skimmed over uh, department reports. I wonder, is it possible to go oh. back to that? Because I'd sure. like to make reference to the note that Mandy sent to all of us. Oh, sure. Yeah, with regard to this award. Um, could you give us just a little bit of background before we I take it to the next step, Mandy? Mm -hmm. uh, absolutely. It's uh, uh, Volunteer Comox Valley Impact Awards. And the Recreation oh, Department right. has uh, uh, nominated somebody in the past for one of the character uh, categories. This one actually was the Brad Earhart Memorial Award, the grant, and uh, pardon me, not grant award. Um, and it's generally you were nominating somebody who's made an impact by helping to build an inclusive community for people with diverse abilities. Uh, Karen Kratz uh, was uh, instrumental in starting the Comox Valley uh, wheelchair basketball uh, community and at our center. She came to us several years ago and asked for time and built the program. It also has gone on to include other sports as well, but right now we're basically focused with basketball. So we nominated Karen for the award, and she won. Great. And I'll be presenting the award to her on April 18th at the award ceremony. Thank you. Yes. Um, uh, may I make a motion? Oh, no. May I make a recommendation? Uh, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to ask one question. Does, does Karen go? She's she does. Okay. I just spoke with her today. Okay. Sorry, well, go ahead, Councilor. Well, I, I was just wanting to suggest that perhaps the town could send a congratulatory note to oh, Karen. I think that's a yeah. very special award. No motion required for that. We'll take care of that. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I, I wasn't sure, like uh, Councilor Sis said, whether she knew about it yet, so I didn't want to. Senator Leonard saying, congratulations to some children. He won the lottery. No. <laughs> All right, so we'll uh, sign a suitable, sign a suitable letter for that okay. in the next few days here. All right, anything else? No? Okay, so we do have a motion to exclude the public under Section 9 sub C and D of uh, the Community Charter. Oh. Is there in favor? Mm -hmm. We'll give a few minutes breather here on that.